Well, welcome to our session uh, through a community-driven archives lens, Arizona State University's community-driven archives initiative. We're really pleased that you're spending the afternoon with us and we appreciate your attendance. Thank you. Next slide, please. We are joining you from ASU's Tempe, Arizona campus. And before we begin, we would like to read ASU's, uh, ASU Libraries Indigenous Land Acknowledgement. The ASU Library acknowledges the 23 Native nations that have inhabited this land for centuries. Arizona State University's four campuses are located in the Salt River Valley on ancestral territories of Indigenous peoples, including the Akmel Otham Pima, and Pipash, Maricopa Indian communities, whose care and keeping of these lands allows us to be here today. ASU Library acknowledges the sovereignty of these nations and seeks to foster an environment of success and possibility for Native American students and patrons. We are advocates for the incorporation of indigenous knowledge systems and research methodologies within contemporary library practice. ASU Library welcomes members of the Akmel Otham and Why was I muted? I don't know. I, I may did... have muted you, Renee, I apologize. <laughs> um, did anyone hear the acknowledgement? Yes. 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 Okay, uh, next slide, please. Uh, this session will highlight and discuss the work of the newly established Black Collections that implements CDA practices, K-12 programming, which centers and uplifts BIPOC and queer knowledge in schools by introducing students to community archives and re-envisioning Greater Arizona Collections and associated community-centered initiatives. The format for this session is a roundtable we will be presenting a number of questions, uh, which we will answer, and then open the floor to questions from the audience. I'm sorry, what? I'm listening to a session. Um, my name is Renee James, and I'm the moderator and a presenter, and I am the curator for the Greater Arizona Collection. I hold an MA in history and a certificate in archival management and historical editing from New York University and an MLIS from San Jose State University. As curator for the Greater Arizona Collection, I acquire archival collections and publish resources and engage in donor relations, online and in-person reference and outreach activities and instructions. I am committed to relationship building with our stakeholders and communities, developing participatory programming and broadening the scope of the collections. I've been in this position since 2017, and a part of the Community Driven Archives Initiative since March of 2022. My colleagues Jasmine Torres and Jessica Salo will now introduce themselves. Hello everyone, I'm Jasmine Torres and I am an assistant archivist for CDA at ASU Library. I have a bachelor's degree in fine arts from Cal Arts and a master's in library and information science from the University of Arizona. I'm pretty new. Uh, I became assistant archivist for CDA last year and I'm coming up on a year here pretty soon. But um, some of my responsibilities in my role include outreach and engagement uh, by organizing and assisting with events and workshops, both inside and outside of ASU. I also do class instruction and develop and implement creative learning, learning activities. I also um, collaborate with faculty, library staff, and curators um, in identifying collections from underrepresented communities and assist with the design of library programming, outreach, and exhibitions. Thank you. 
Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jessica or Jess. I'll respond to either one. Salo, Assistant Archivist, Black Collections here at Arizona State University Library, Tempe Campus. Uh, I am a graduate of Arizona State University. I graduated in 2011 with a history and political science major. Um, I also have an MLIS from the University of Arizona, which I graduated in 2017. I have been a part of the Community Driven Archives Initiative since May of 2019. Uh, some of my current responsibilities in include uh, curating and managing a brand new collection, which I'll talk about more uh, in my upcoming slides here called Black Collections, uh, which is a collection that uplifts, highlight, and supports the ASU Black and African-American staff, faculty, and students, as well as the outside organ uh, uh, communities that surround the Arizona State University's four campuses in the Met uh, Phoenix metropolitan area. Thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. We look forward to talking to you more about the work we do. Uh, next slide, please. Our first area of discussion uh, will address this question. Uh, what does CDA at ASU Library look like? Next slide. Okay, um, I'll be presenting first. In order to expand more on that question, uh, I wanted to start with some information about the history of CDA, and, as well as our mission and some of the key goals that we have especially uh, for the upcoming year. CDA at uh, ASU Library was established in 2017 by our director, Nancy Godoy, who is also um, associate, associate archivist of the Chicano Chicana Research Collection. CDA actually began as a Mellon grant in 2017, and the department has grown. Um, uh, it has grown from Chicano, Chicano Research Collection and Black Collections to also include University Archives, the Greater Arizona Collection, and Collections Arrangement and Description. And under the CDA umbrella, there are nine professionals on our team, the three of us presenting included. So a little bit about the slide here. CDA's mission is to reimagine and transform 21st century academic libraries by developing and implementing innovative solutions that address inequities and erasure in archives. So what are we actually doing at CDA to support our mission? First of all, we aim to dismantle racist power structures that have led to the erasure and trauma of those from underrepresented communities such as the BIPOC and LGBTQ plus communities. We are also working with Arizona's Latinx, Black, Asian, and Pacific Islander, Indigenous, and LGBTQ communities to preserve their history and also create intersectional and intergenerational safe spaces. Um, also to address these inequities and liberate archives, CDA is developing and implementing innovative solutions to enhance our local impact in general that we have and our social embeddedness, which we're gonna get a little bit more into later. And lastly, on the issue of accessibility uh, in regard to CDA, accessibility to archival collections and free resources are also extremely important factors that we like to address. We actually offer free archival kits uh, with actual archival supplies that we use here with everything included, mylar folders, gloves, in an archival box, uh, to those who attend our workshops or anyone in general that reaches out and wants to start the preservation of their own personal archive. Next slide. So why do we need CDA in the first place? Um, and why is it important? And why are we doing the work that we do? In most Archives 101 workshops that we give or classroom visits that we do, we feature the information in this slide because the statistic is very telling of why CDA's mission, mission and goals are what they are. So according to the Arizona Archives Matrix project from 2012, Latinx, Black, Asian, and Pacific Islander and the LGBTQ plus community make up over 42% of Arizona's population but are only represented in zero to 2% of known archival collections. Um, while this isn't super surprising, it is extremely disappointing. And that is a very small percentage considering the size of the diverse population that we have here in Arizona that includes the communities that I've been mentioning. And the statistic really hasn't changed even after 10 plus years. And 
To expand on this project, not just ASU participated in this study, it was also 15 other Arizona institutions, um, some that kind of have like larger collections to mention would be like um, the Arizona Historical Society, University of Arizona, and Northern Arizona University, just to name a few. So this information was pulled from that collective data in the study, and that data is yet another reason why CDA is emphasizing the importance of preservation of those underrepresented communities. Next slide. Okay, um, so these, this um, next part is really just to emphasize the work that I've done so far with CDA archives and a new pro program that I have just implemented called CDA Escuelita. Next slide. Um, first, I wanted to talk about impact and social embeddedness. Um, in ASU's charter and under our mission and goals, impact and social embeddedness is listed as a key goal. And there are some goals that we think of when thinking of CDA's impact. First of all, we're thinking about how are we actually providing the tools needed for learners and community to succeed? And um, how are we meeting the needs of the community through, um, quote, and this is from the charter, personalized learning pathways that promote adaptability to emergent social and technological changes, end quote. Um, so the second part of this slide is 98.5% of people who attend CDA events feel prepared to be community archivists after receiving in training and see the urgency to provide BIPOC and LGBTQ plus history in Arizona. So when we have any of these events, Archives 101, symposiums, anything like that, we will usually encourage those attending to fill out a survey. We provide them in order to get feedback. That way we know as a team, what do we need to work on and rethink, and then we can brainstorm on how to be more effective in the future with our outreach and engagement. Um, and by doing this, we are also making sure that those uh, who come to our, our events feel more empowered and hopefully also leave wanting to teach others how to do the work that they've learned as well. Next slide. All right. Oh, wow, I, I heard my voice in an echo. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, CDA has transformed quite a bit in the past year in how it's organized and our approach to outreach and instruction in our department. So along with these changes came new ideas for strategic planning for our next few years. The list of goals is a bit long, so I just really wanted to speak to one program that I've had involvement in, a program that we've had, I've had involvement in so far. It's really a pilot program as of this point. Um, and it was just launched at the end of last year. And that is CDA Escuelita or our little school program. So prior to working with CDA, I was a TA and a teacher working in elementary education, usually at Title I schools. So in planning for what Escuelita was gonna look like, I tried to use my previous experience as an educator working with young students, uh, many bilingual students, and that is why this project is extra dear to me. Mm -hmm. So um, from this slide, BIPOC students make up the majority of K-12 schools in Arizona, and in some schools in Phoenix, they make up 80, per, 80 to 90 percent of students. So um, someone else on our team who's a specialist, Kenya Menchaca Lozano, um, was in charge of gathering uh, data on the specific schools that have mostly BIPOC students, but the ones that we visited so far, I would say mostly have uh, Latino or Hispanic students making up the majority. We also want to introduce kid archivists and elementary schools to the importance of preserving their stories. Uh, we realized that kid archivists are going to be the future of archives in general, uh, we're also looking to create a network of teachers, partners, and community organizations from Arizona. Since this is very new, we're just starting that process of creating that network and also establishing trust with the schools that we are um, looking at right now. And lastly, we're trying to further develop 
kit archivist toolkits that contain lesson plans that center BIPOC and LGBTQ plus history and narratives. I'm going to talk more about that kit archivist toolkit in the next slide. Um, but a lot of this, um, a lot of these resources that we have are also included on our CDA website. So some of these toolkits that we're bringing with us to these schools are uh, accessible online for everyone. Next slide. All right. And creating content to support lifelong learning. Um, I mentioned I had a fine arts background. And so when I came onto this team, I just, you know, tried as much as I could to try to make some creative uh, learning solutions and uh, put that into Escuelita. Not everything on this slide has to do with Escuelita or have been implemented in that, but uh, a few of them are. Um, so there on the left, instructional tools for kid archivists. This is our Escuelita activity book. This is mostly for K to five students, but so far we've just tried it with third graders just to see how it goes. Um, this booklet is really a way to guide students on their way to being kid archivists. It's a way to also encourage drawing, writing, and sharing content with others. What we've found so far is a lot of, you know, principals and teachers are trying to get their students to do more writing. So we're trying to keep in mind um, what teachers want as well when we go into these schools. Um, and like I said, it's available in physical copies or an online resource. And this is included in their kid archive kits. So much like we have a, uh, archive kits for adults, we also have them for kids, but instead of being in an archival box, it is like in a big Ziploc baggie. Um, so a little different. And then there in the middle, um, I love zines. I love just zine education. So I've started doing um, zine activities with classes as well through the Escalita pilot, pilot program. Um, zines are pretty much just little booklets that you can publish on your own for those that aren't too familiar with zines. But um, I'm pretty much interested in them creating content to put in their archives. And then creative spaces as safe spaces. Um, through these art artistic activities, I want to create safe spaces uh, for all communities, but also, of course, um, with Escuelita. And lastly, I wanted to highlight our new podcast there on the right, which is also the, um, considered another kind of non-traditional archive, a, a podcast. We recently published all of season one of our new podcast, Archives Glow, which is now available on Spotify. I partnered with a ASU journalism student named Adriana Gonzalez Chavez. For her thesis project, she decided to assist CDA with this podcast as a producer, and I assisted her with finding guests for the interviews, and she edit, edited and recorded the content. Um, so Adriana is actually graduating this semester, so we're trying to figure out what we're going to do for season two. Uh, our goal with this podcast was to create a podcast about community history, memory, and healing that empowers BIPOC and LGBTQ communities to preserve their stories and archives, but to also uh, be able to amplify the voices of those communities by giving them a platform to share their knowledge and stories. I would also consider it a accessible and safe space for listeners who have um, shared similar experiences to hopefully relate to it heal and inspire them as well. And that's it, thank you. Okay, so for this section, I'm gonna be talking about the brand new collection that is Black Collections here at Arizona State University. Uh, as I stated, um, this collection is something that is very near and dear, not only to me, but to the Community Driven Archives Initiative team um, as it uh, is a collection that really documents and focuses just on the Black and African American uh, community of ASU and our external community. So I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in the upcoming slides. Uh, first, I wanted to very quickly just show a video of that connection that we make with community when we are doing our workshops. And apologies to the people maybe in the room. This might not be uh, super loud for you all, but I wanted to make sure that uh, this video was something that I do show and to talk about uh, afterwards. So it's about a 30 second clip. So I'll go ahead and play it. Oops, my apologies. Sorry about that. Let's see. Let it resound louder. 
So the reason I like to play this clip is because this was a spontaneous event that happened at one of our community archiving workshops. This was the Scanning and Oral History Day workshop that we did uh, prior to COVID. And so the reason why this is such a, a special clip for me is because it absolutely shows the ability for us as archives and as archivists with the work that we do with community to connect and to be able to have that ability to share exactly why it is important for community to be involved in the archival process. Uh, the reason why this started, um, I unfortunately wasn't, part, wasn't a part of the team when this happened, but the uh, way that it was told to me was that uh, somebody brought the lyrics to Lift Every Voice and Sing to this event. And uh, as somebody was scanning it for uh, folks, people just decided to go ahead and start singing the hymn, which is uh, a very important uh, song and hymn for us, uh, for all of us within the Black and African American American community. So for me, this clip really does show and signifies, at least for me, the understanding of that genuine and true connection to community and why it is so absolutely critical for us as academic institutions, but libraries uh, and museums and archives just in general, to make that connection with community. Because if you do, you will have a lifelong kind of understanding of what is needed uh, for your community when you're doing this particular work. So I want to first talk about how Black Collections became a uh, a thing. Uh, Black Collections was established in 20, I'm sorry, in 2021 with the direct support of the Listen, Invest, Facilitate, Teach initiative, which we call the LIFT initiative here at Arizona State University. Um, to the left, I believe it's left on my end. I don't know if it's left on most people's end, but it's left on my end. There, uh, This email that was put out by our president, Dr. Michael Crow, after the unfortunate events of 2020, and that included the murder of George Floyd, the Black Lives Matter movement, and uh, there was a an individual here in the Phoenix metropolitan area, Dion Johnson, who was uh, uh, killed uh, by police. Uh, and so there was a lot going on in 2020. And so uh, when Dr. Crow put out this uh, this call to talk about how ASU uh, needed to and uh, wanted to uplift and highlight the work that Black and African-American faculty, students, and staff were already doing within ASU. Um, at that time, a CDA was still a grant-funded initiative, as my colleague Jasmine said, and we didn't know whether or not we would be able to continue the work that we were doing, um, even though we had really great data to show that it made an impact and that it was important for us to continue this work. So when this initiative came out, we uh, uh, asked our upper leadership if we could apply to be a part of this initiative. Um, and so uh, our leadership agreed that they would go ahead and submit our initiative as one of the uh, potential proposals that Lyft would fund. And uh, so we submitted it and we waited, uh, we waited, we waited, and we waited. And finally, uh, we were able to get uh, a word that we were number 23 of 25 initiatives that were funded under Lyft initiative. So this is how Black Collections became the collection that it is today and how I was retained as the archivist curator of of Black Collections here at Arizona State University. Uh, to the right of that email is the um a snippet of the initial report uh, that was uh, established after Lyft uh, came out uh, regarding the 25 initiatives that they were going to fund. And we were the T9 uh, initiative. So fund and sustain ASU Library's award-winning community-driven archives initiative in order to enhance Arizona's historical records and the university's engagement with underserved and underrepresented communities. So because of this initiative, I was retained as the archivist of Black Collections. Uh, and then my colleague, Jasmine Torres, who uh, is on this call today, was also also, uh, her position was also funded under Lyft Initiative. So if it was not for the direct support of this initiative, uh, community-driven archives and Black collections would not be in the place that it is in today. We would no longer be anything uh, because we were no longer going to be able to have funding in order to do the work that we were doing. Um, and so some of the data that was put out where Lyft was concerned, and this is the reason why it, I think Dr. Crow really wanted to make sure that he was trying to uplift, highlight, and support the Black and African American faculty, students, and staff of ASU, is that as you can see, uh, ASU is a predominantly white institution, and we do have some representation of Black and African American people, but it's not it's not high, right? And so if you look here at this data, ASU composes 4% of ASU, I'm sorry, Black uh, faculty and staff at ASU composed only 4% of ASU's total faculty and staff in 2020. Uh, by this grouping, the faculty represent 3.4%. 
Uh, and that includes 4.8% for graduate assistants and 5.3% of ASU's non-faculty staff. Uh, when it comes to the students uh, around 2020, it was around 9% uh, of ASU's total population student-wise was Black and African-American students, uh, which represents in double-digit percentages compared to the other groups. And as you can see from this, um, the white student population, 67%, Hispanic, uh, Latino, Latina was at 23%. And we just recently became his, an, a Hispanic serving institution. So that number probably has lifted up a little bit more um, over the last three years. And then our Asian student population, it was at 13%. So again, it is imperative for us to understand the representation of Black and African American students and faculty, staff, and others who support this institution when it comes to uh, Black and African American uh, racial and ethnic identities. And so again, Black Collections really is one of those fundamental uh, reasons, and LIFT is one of those fundamental reasons why we are in the position that we are. And we always want to give thanks to ASU LIFT initiatives for supporting this initiative and for supporting Black collections. So I wanted to talk about some of the things that I've been doing over the last year. I've been the archivist of Black Collections uh, since August of 2021. So I'm coming up on my two-year anniversary in August of this year. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to have a lot of publicity within ASU in order to talk about the work that I'm doing and to let folks know that Black Collections at Arizona State University is a thing and that we would like to support any efforts that Black and African American faculty, students, and staff are doing within ASU in order to highlight um, the long legacy that Black and African American people have had here at ASU. Most people might not realize or understand we have been um, a part of ASU's history since uh, the 1920s. Our first Black graduate was in 1924. So we've had a long, long history of Black and African American students, faculty, and staff here at Arizona State University. But I don't think many people realize and understand that long legacy of Black uh, history here at ASU. So uh, at, in 2020, I'm sorry, in 2021, in January, I was able to do a uh, conversation uh, with um, some of uh, the people here within Arizona State University to talk about Black collections. And so uh, that has from that uh, particular event, it was really awesome to get to talk to others about the work that I'm doing and the understanding of why Black and African American uh, uh, collection here at Arizona State University was needed and should have been started uh, prior to 2021. But here we are, you know, this is what it is. Um, and so if you're interested in learning more about the work that I'm doing, uh, this particular conversation is highlighted on our ASU Library YouTube page. And so if you would like to learn or hear me talk about that uh, in January 21, I highly encourage you to go ahead and go to our YouTube page. Um, to the right of that, um, I've been fortunate enough to uh, have the collection that my colleague Shannon Walker, who is our university archivist, bring into uh, ASU Library, which is the collection of Dr. J. Eugene Grigsby Jr. He was a faculty member here at Arizona State State University from the 1960s until the 1980s. He was also a very prolific artist and was also a very prolific activist uh, uh, here in the Phoenix metropolitan area. And he was able to highlight, ups, uplift, and support not only the students within uh, ASU uh, who were dedicated to art, but to also talk about how um, the connection to Black artists uh, is an imperative part of the understanding of your community. And so uh, I also did, I have done quite a bit of um, uh, events regarding that collection. So if you're interested in learning more about Dr. Grigsby and hearing more about his history here at ASU, this celebration of Dr. Eugene Grigsby Jr. Uh, is also available on our ASU library uh, YouTube page. And then to the left, I just wanted to highlight a couple of the uh, our articles and quotes that I have done since January of 2022 and 2021, um, I'm sorry, yes, 2022, to uh, talk about Black collections and the reason why I am so passionate about the work that I'm doing here and why it's very significant and important for us to uh, highlight and uplift and support. As my colleague Jasmine said, only zero to two percent of known archival collections represent Black and African American people here in Arizona. And so for me, this collection and the ways that I am working with the community is of critical importance to make sure, again, we understand and realize that Black and African American people have been not only here at ASU, but in Arizona for generations and will continue to be here for generations. There we go. Okay, hi. Uh, so our next area of discussion concerns the following question. Uh, how have CDA concepts 
change the model for AAC library archival collections. Next slide, please. And uh, next slide. So I'm gonna start with an overview of the Greater Arizona Collection, including a, um, a discussion of the legacy collections. So the Greater Arizona Collection offers and contributes to an understanding of the diverse cultural and political history of the region through the preservation and access to essential and important documentation of events, people, and communities. The collection supports all levels of research and curriculum, offering historical, social, political, economic, and cultural contributions. The collections are comprised of published and unpublished materials in all formats, including primary and secondary resources that document the history of Arizona and the Southwest, with the bulk of the collections dating to the 20th and 21st centuries. Collection materials include personal papers, organizational and business records, congressional and political papers, and a myriad of resource materials on Arizona and the Southwest. Materials and collections support basic informational, instructional, research, and comprehensive collecting levels. Primary emphasis is on transdisciplinary materials that reflect the intersectional, historical, biographical, political, social, cultural, educational, and economic aspects of the region. The collection observes the primary right of affiliated indigenous communities and works within the protocols for Native American archival materials guidelines. And, and for those who are unfamiliar with the protocols, these are best practices for indigenous materials uh, that are held in non-tribal institutions. With over 500 collections, the Greater Arizona Collection not only documents and preserves key facets of Arizona history, um, but it also serves as a significant and essential resource for scholars, students, and Arizona's diverse communities. Uh, next slide. Uh, the geographical location is primarily documenting Central Arizona and Phoenix, though it does include other areas. And subjects reflect the wide range of materials collected and people represented. Uh, specialized topics include political history, um, of course, Arizona and Phoenix history, water and land management, mining and labor history, community or identity-based history, and business and organizational histories. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so now I'm going to highlight two collections which reflect CDA's mission and focus. Uh, the B.J. Budd Memorial Archives, the largest LGBTQ plus collection in Arizona, was assembled by local LGBTQ plus activists in the Valley of the Sun Gay and Lesbian Center. Thanks to the 2017 Andrew W. Mellon uh, Foundation grant, a large selection of this collection has been digitized and is accessible online in PRISM, ASU's digital repository, and via an online exhibit, which provides a summary and overview of the collection with digitized photographs and periodicals. Uh, next slide, please. The Onik Family Papers is a newly acquired collection, uh, which was recently processed. Uh, this important collection documents the lives and experiences of a Japanese American family living in uh, Phoenix, and then later in Seattle and California, uh, dating from the 19th through 20th centuries. Uh, the Onik Family Papers house correspondence, photographs, clippings, performance uh, programs, because one of the daughters was an opera singer and contracts related to her career, uh, real estate records and other materials document, documenting Hachiro and Catherine Onik and their children, Ben, Tom, Marion, and Helen. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about re-envisioning the Greater Arizona Collection. Um, my goal is to work toward establishing meaningful and essential relationships and partnerships with marginalized communities, acknowledging community trauma and working toward healing processes and to ensure that these communities are engaged at all levels of the process. Key communities uh, for the Greater Arizona Collection include Asian and Pacific Islander, Japanese American and LGBTQ plus communities. I'm also interested in develop developing a reparative description uh, project, which would include a review of legacy descriptive resources 
such as finding aids to identify obsolete, offensive, imprecise, or harmful language, um, and also including um, images and uh, other materials. And my goal is also to provide easy access to collections and establish safe spaces for communities um, with a particular interest in making the reading room a more welcoming space for communities. Next slide, please. Uh, so for me, uh, because Black Collections is so new, um, I'll just talk a little bit about uh, my work and how this question really relates to, to the work that I'm doing. So as I said, because Black Collections is such a brand new position or brand new collection, uh, I need to do everything, honestly. Um, and so it really was important for me when I became the archivist of Black Collections to review our traditional collections, and that includes the Greater Arizona Collection, as well as the University Archival, uh, Archives Collection here at Arizona State University, mm -hmm. to see what material documents Black and African American people. Um, and then when I got together with my colleagues, Renee James and Shannon Walker, and uh, at that time, our processing archivist, uh, Charmaine Bonner, uh, to talk about what was available within our traditional collections that document Black and African American people. Uh, after we did our analysis, came together, um, unfortunately, there isn't very much that was available uh, within our traditional collections uh, when it came to the documentation of Black and African American people uh, in general. Um, and I hope most folks on this call and in the room understand and realize our profession is uh, dominated by white uh, you know, people. And so when you don't uh, have that representation within your particular uh, profession and the understanding of why it's important to maybe think outside the box when it comes to collecting of different ethnic and racial uh, identities and the way that they uh, document people. Uh, ASU traditionally has been very focused on manuscript collections, which I'll talk about a little bit at um, in, in another bullet point here. And so for me, uh, when this information became available, again, it really highlighted and kind of put a fire under my butt to say, we really need to make sure that we are focusing in on understanding how to collect and uh, uh, the, the memories and stories of Black and African American communities, but then also think about how that, uh, you know, previously has been done and the ways in which collection development policies uh, in general kind of uh, exclude the understanding of how Black and African American people tell their stories and how they keep their memories. And so for me, I'm also in the process of working on a collection development policy that is very, very much a part of the community uh, conversations that I'm having with folks and the understanding that community input needs to be first and foremost when it comes to a collection development policy and what community wants to see from this collection. This collection cannot be and will not be a collection that is, uh, you know, something that I want to specialize a, a particular part in, I want to hear from the community. I need to hear from the community about what they would like to see uh, when it comes to this collection. And so cr creating a collection development policy that is has a, a lot of community input and really uh, thinking of non-traditional ways in order to uh, how to collect from community uh, when it comes to the understanding of Black and African American stories and memory keeping. And so again, for me, it is very important that I'm advocating for non-manuscript collections. Uh, right now, I'm in conversations to try and see if we can start an oral history repository here at Arizona State University Library. Um, in general, Black and African American communities tell our stories by passing down uh, stories, memories, telling telling, you know, different memories throughout the, you know, our family gatherings, stuff like that. Um, and so this is traditionally how we as Black and African American people learn our history is through our aunties, our uncles, our elders telling us stories about times before people who have come uh, down our, our lines. And so while previously I know oral histories in general have not been something that has been thought of as an archival, um, you know, um, an archival quality kind of way in which uh, to document, uh, that really is something that I, I wanna push back on and make sure that our profession understands. And I think it is in general becoming a more known understanding that oral histories really is the way in which we need to be uh, doing that community involvement and that community engagement, especially when it comes to racial and ethnic um, uh, groups who uh, are very much non-represented within archival collections. Um, also, artifacts and 3D objects uh, in general are another way that Black and African American communities uh, tell our stories and share our memories. I know for me, I have a number of knickknacks and different things uh, that were passed down to me from my grandparents. And so, uh, 
it is important to make sure that if you are in an institutional archive or in uh, an archive just in general, that if you are not thinking about or not collecting artifacts or 3D objects, that you really take that consideration and understand that you may be missing a large gap of uh, the collecting process when it comes to trying to document other uh, identities outside of the white identity. So uh, for us here at ASU, this is also another ongoing conversation that I'm having to make sure Black Collections is uh, a collection that is very encompassing, very much uh, a part of the understanding of what community wants to see within that collection. And then obviously donor relations is another huge part of the work that I'm doing. Um, I'm either repairing or establishing relationships with Black and African-American faculty, students, and staff here at ASU um, that have historically either not had anybody here at the library that they can talk to about um, the services that are available or the ways in which which um, the community would like to see that. And so um, in order to establish and build this collection, I really need to focus in on donor relations. And that is uh, an important part and will continue to always be an important part of the work that I'm doing here at Arizona State University to establish Black collections and make sure folks know uh, that no matter what, uh, if this collection can't be of service, there is a service available to them here at Arizona State University Library and what that can look like uh, when you are doing that donor relation and that uh, serve or in that relationship building just in general. Okay, so our last uh, area of discussion and question is how has archival work changed uh, at ASU Library under the CDA model? And I would just like to point out if you look to uh, the image on the left, um, that is our current org chart uh, and the composition of the department. And uh, just to note, uh, we uh, are continuing to grow. Um, there's open uh, recruitment for two archival positions. Um, if you want more information, take a look at the ASU Library website or you can um, contact one of us. Uh, next slide, please. So for the Greater Arizona Collection, there's been a shift um, on some of the emphasis from legacy subjects and acquisitions to outreach programming and reparative projects. Um, for example, we partnered um, with um, ASU's LGBTQ plus faculty and staff association, and that's the image on the upper right, um, for a special event and an Archives 101 workshop. Uh, one of these events was entitled Our Histories, Our Voices, Preserving and Raising Queer uh, Perspectives. Um, at that event, a selection from the BJ Budd Memorial Archives was displayed. Uh, with an introduction to the collection and invited uh, guests shared and ref reflected on their past experiences and recollections. Another example of this is my ongoing observance of the protocols uh, for Native American materials and my work with ASU's Labriola National American Indian Data Centers, Indigenous librarians and archivists to review materials that may contain culturally sensitive subjects or information that is restricted to the associated indigenous communities. For example, um, when a reference or research uh, request contain these kinds of materials, I'll reach out and consult with my colleagues to review the items and we can do that one by one and restrict those that contain uh, culturally sensitive subjects. I was also in conversation and look forward to future discussions uh, with Labriola colleagues to review greater uh, Arizona collections that contain uh, indigenous content and to discuss the disposition of these collections or items. Uh, some options include repatriation to the associated community or to transfer those collections of materials to the Labriola centers so that indigenous staff are managing those items. And I would also like to add that I continue to manage and engage with legacy collections and donors uh, in addition to implementing and addressing these CDA uh, related projects and initiatives. Finding the balance uh, for the responsible stewardship for all of the collections and new programming and initiatives is one of the challenges in re-envisioning the Greater Arizona Collection. Next slide. 
So for me, uh, uh, as I said, uh, since Black Collections is so new, uh, I have done a lot of, as I said, uh, relationship building just in general uh, re, uh, for uh, this collection in order, to, again, to make sure that the Arizona State University's uh, faculty, students, and staff, especially Black and African-American uh, faculty, students, and staff, have the understanding that this collection is available and, uh, and wanting to assist in any type of understanding of how to uplift, highlight, and support Black and African-American people. Um, and then also, I want to make sure that I'm connecting with the outside communities, again, that, that surround our campuses. And so I've done a lot of events over the last year. Um, the two to the very right, uh, the Juneteenth celebration and the Black uh, History and Preservation Symposium were two events that I did in 2022 uh, that were of special and uh, very particular interest to me, uh, just in general, again, to make sure that I'm doing that outreach and programming, educational programming available uh, to understand uh, recently. Obviously, Juneteenth has become one of those uh, kind of bigger uh, celebrations uh, within the zeitgeist, just in general, it became uh, recently a federal holiday. Um, and so for this event last year, we really wanted to make sure that we were uh, doing a partnership with the Arizona uh, Historical Society at the Tempe location of the Arizona Heritage Center uh, to talk about Juneteenth and why it's significant to Arizona and those migration stories of people who came to Arizona from other places uh, and why Juneteenth just in general is important. Uh, in the middle, we are continuing that Juneteenth programming this year where we'll be doing another Juneteenth event at Arizona Heritage Center on Sunday, June. 18th. So if you are in the Phoenix metropolitan area on Sunday, June 18th, uh, and you're looking for an event to do, please come by the Arizona Heritage Center because we will be doing another Juneteenth celebration uh, called Roads to Freedom. And we are very much looking forward to providing that programming to the community to understand, again, the significance of Juneteenth and why that's important. Um, last year, I did that Black History and Preservation Symposium, and that brought together a number of uh, community members as well as preservation experts to talk about not just how to preserve archival memory, but again, how to potentially preserve uh, buildings or other kind of memory uh, that is significant to the Black and African American communities uh, in the Arizona, uh, in the state of Arizona, but uh, more specifically in the Phoenix metropolitan area. Uh, and so, and then the bottom here is an exhibit that I, that is currently up here at Hayden Library Tempe campus uh, that again talks about and highlights and celebrates the legacy of Dr. J. Eugene Grigsby Jr. Uh, I have been fortunate enough to get to know a number of folks who knew Dr. Grigsby before he passed away and then we've also been able to highlight three artists here in the Phoenix metropolitan area who were influenced by Dr. Grigsby either through the teachings here at Arizona State University or when he became a um a, a um a professor, I'm sorry, not professor, a teacher at Phoenix Union High School after desegregation, because he was uh, with the Carver uh, uh, School, which was the historically black school uh, prior to segregation. And then when uh, desegregation happened, he was moved to Phoenix Union High School. And so we have three artists on display uh, here currently at Hayden Library uh, that talks about the legacy of Dr. J. Eugene Grigsby Jr. And this exhibit will be up uh, till the end of June. So again, if you are in the Phoenix metropolitan area and would like to see the exhibit and would like to come to Hayden Library, uh, this exhibit will be up until the end of June. And then last week, um, I did a Black Memory and Storytelling Symposium uh, that brought together Black and African American faculty, as well as, again, community members to talk about how uh, Black memory and storytelling is happening and what that is doing, not only for the professors uh, and for the uh, faculty here at ASU, but what that looks like within our external community, just in general, to provide that educational uh, programming and support for folks to know that Black Collections is a community uh, archive and we want that community input and want that community uh, engagement with everyone to understand what we can do in order to support uh, Black and African American people here in Arizona. All right, really quickly, I wanted to expand a bit on how we're working to empower BIPOC communities through our outreach and programs. Um, First off, we're going to continue to work on and grow Escuelita and empower K-12 students by guiding them on their way to be kid archivists. That photo on the left is uh, from a visit Jessica and I did to Agua Fria High School to their uh, Black Student Union to talk to their students. We gave an Archives 101 and Black History and Archives presentation, which was led by Jessica. And there in the middle of uh, we will also continue to work with Chicano Chicana and Latinx organizations 
That middle photo shows Nancy Godoy, our director, and Yesenia Ramos, a current grad a student worker with us. And they're hosting an, um, a scanning and preservation event at Chicanos por la Causa, or Chicanos for the Cause Community Center. Uh, it was a really cool event, and um, a good amount of people came out. We scanned a lot of photos that day. Lastly, we will continue to work with LGBTQ organizations like Transquare Pueblo or TQP. TQP supports the LGBTQ plus community by providing resources for this community, like health services, education, and legal support, just to name a few things. And that photo on the right is actually the first um, event that I had ever helped with. It's a photo of me providing photo and scanning and printing services at TQP that night. And it was a really beautiful event. Um, lots of community members asked us to print photos of their loved ones to put up. Um, you kind of see in the background, it's a Dia de los Muertos altar. Uh, so that's where they were putting their photos that night. Um, next slide. All right. Lastly, um, on this slide, we just included a few of the organizations and institutions that we have built relationships with and have partnered with before, most of which were mentioned during the presentation. And also we're working toward building new relationships and partnerships in the future and hopefully growing or expanding on this list with new partnerships as well. Hi, um, well, thank you for your insights and for highlighting the CDA mission from its inception as a 2017 Mellon grant uh, to its growth and development into a library department with the, su the support of ASU's LIFT initiative and library administration. Uh, your work and the work of the CDA department continues and evolves as we work to empower and engage with Arizona's BIPOC and marginalized communities. Thank you both. And we can now take questions. I'll start with a, a question. Um, put it bluntly, I guess, Arizona's legislature and, and governor's office has often been directly opposed to initiatives that, that you all are engaged in. Is there, how, do, how is the university um, and the library uh, prepared to respond if this does happen when the legislature in the next session comes out and, 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 and attempts to stop the work that you're engaged in? Renee or Jasmine, do you want to take that one? I can answer a little bit if if nobody wants to take you, that. You can start. Go ahead. Um, what I will say is that, you know, we are very aware of uh, the legislation that is going on here in Arizona. And while we are keeping our eye on it, that is not at this particular point stopping us in the work that we are doing. Uh, obviously, you know, we have a lot of support from our leadership and uh, from ASU in general. I've, I've heard through conversations that I've had with other folks uh, just in general that ASU very much is advocating uh, for the understanding of how to make sure that, uh, you know, the state in general doesn't try to exclude uh, the understanding of BIPOC people's place within um, the work that, you know, we do as an institution. And so for us, while we are aware of this legislation at this particular point, it is not stopping us from doing uh, the work that we're doing until we hear otherwise from our leadership. Uh, we will not stop uh, in the understanding of the work that we need to do. So in general, yes, uh, we are aware, but in general, we are not stopping uh, with a lot of that work. Uh, Renee or Jasmine? Uh, yeah, I, you know, agree with um, the our, uh, what Jessica was saying about our approach. Of course, you know, we're concerned and we're um, aware of uh, the legislation or the proposed legislation. So um, it hasn't stopped any of our work or initiatives. And um, I just see us moving forward. I don't see unless there's something drastic that happens, I don't see that it will impede the progress that we have made and are making. Um, yes, I'd have to say I agree with both of your comments um, in regard to kind of the work I've been doing, like with Escuelita and actually going into schools. Um, I talk to the principals and the teachers before I go in and I tell them exactly 
what CDA is all about, the type of language that we're using. Um, so I'm not really going into any classroom with them not knowing what we are talking about, but yes, I'm just going to continue to kind of center that BIPOC and LGBTQ history um, until, you know, we hear otherwise. There's a question in the chat from Mary Manning who asks, you mentioned university archives. Could you tell us more? How are you implementing CDA with your university archives? So um, I see that our university archivist, Shannon Walker, is on this call. And Shannon, I don't know if you would like to unmute yourself and actually talk about this question, uh, but I think if Shannon is willing to unmute and talk about uh, what she is doing to implement CDA within uh, university archives, that probably would be best to have her answer that question. Sure. Hello, everyone. I wasn't planning on being on <laughs> presenting today, but here I am. Um, I would say um, we're doing a couple of things. One is when we're offered collections, um, we are trying to prioritize collections that are coming from communities of color. Now, as University Archives, we have a mandate to collect the history of the school across the board. So, um, you know, we'll collect, we'll still say yes to almost everything. We still have our collection development policy, but um, we, like mentioned by my colleagues, we really do work really hard to establish relationships with, um, with faculty and students and communities of color. So those are the ones we're working hard to proactively get donations from. Now we're all continually offered donations from everyone across the board, but those are where we're proactive. And I think the other thing that we're doing is we are going back to existing legacy collections and re-examining them, maybe even reappraising them to highlight um, the voices um, for communities of color um, within those collections. And an example of that is our yearbooks collection, right? I mean, everyone knows yearbooks. We use yearbooks all the time. But we're going back with that CDA lens, looking at yearbooks and just looking at if you were a student, a black student in Arizona in 1925, what did it look like to be a, a student on the ASU campus? <laughs> it's pretty eye opening to consider. And when we discovered the story of the first female black graduate, there's if that's a long story. You can Google it and you, there's videos and there's news things. But um, we had to sort of change our, our written record about who it was and what their, it was like, but <clears throat> it, it helped us um, just think through what their experience would be like. And then we look in, and that was 1925 when she graduated. We look at like just a couple years later, um, there are students of color in the yearbook, but they're not highlighted. They're almost hidden. <laughs> so um, so yeah, so those are ways we're re-examining the student newspapers, we're re-examining student clubs, and um, another project I'm working on is with the Asian American community, and, and the, actually the Asian Japanese American student community, on what happened during World War II to students who were um, on campus or maybe started out as students, but then because of... Um, <clears throat> relocation, incarceration, what what was their experience? We see them sort of disappear from the university records and then they reappear after the war. You know, were there formal policies about that and what happened? So those are ways we're just taking our existing collections, re-examining that. And um, yeah, that's, that's what we're doing, building relationships. Those are kind of the three things. So I'm happy to answer more questions too, if you want to talk offline too. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, it looks like we are, go ahead. Yeah, we're at time. So um, thank you all. And let's give them one more round.